It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this special session of the Global Operations Leadership Seminar. For more than 25 years, the LGO program has been bringing in together the rigor and the technical expertise of the MIT School of Engineering, the leadership practice, business, and cutting edge theory of the MIT Sloan School of Management, and the real world experience of the LGO manufacturing and operations industry partners. This leadership seminar has been a unique opportunity for students and faculty to connect with world-class practice leaders. Today is definitely not the exception. We are proud to welcome the Honorable Felipe Calderon, who served as President of Mexico from 2006 to 2012. President Calderon has a law degree from the Escuela Libre de Derecho, a master's in economics from the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, and a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, where he later participated as an Angelopoulos Leader Fellow. During his tenure, Mexico became one of the most important exporters in the world, with 60% of the manufactured products in Latin America and the Caribbean region. He has been named Statesman of the Year by the World Economic Forum, Champion of the Earth by, by the United Nations. He also received the Terry Roosevelt International Conservation Award, the Global Legislators Organization for a Balanced Environment Award, International Star of Energy Efficiency Award, among many other recognitions for being a global leader in environmental issues. Currently, he is a member of the Policy Advisor Council for the World Business Council of Sustainable Development, President of Sustainable Human Development Foundation, a member of the Board of Directors of the World Resources Institute, and Chairman of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate, responsible for coordinating the Better Climate, Better Growth, the New Climate Economy Report. Needless to ask us to remain respectful and maintain our academic environment. Please join me in welcoming him as our special guest of today's Global Operation Leadership Seminar. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Do uh, you have water over there? A bottle or just I can see a lot of bottles over there, but it, no one is mine. Thank you. I have one. Well, thank you for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here in MIT. Um, uh, I will talk about, not about my favorite issues that are regarding environment. Maybe I will talk later about that. But I'm, we talk about a uh, uh, problem. I have a lot of problems I need to face, a lot of challenges as president. But uh, I, according with the program or the purpose of the program, I want to focus on one aspect, which is the economic crisis uh, in Mexico or the global economic crisis and its impact in Mexico, how we did deal with that and uh, what happened at that moment. So let me start with that. You know very well the story, the, you can see this terrible recession in the American economy. And you can imagine the impact over Mexico because more than 80% of total exports are coming to American markets. So the impact in Mexico is completely correlated. The exporting side of the Mexican economy went down dramatically. Actually, our economy went down at was going down at a speed of all, almost 10% negative in the first and the second quarter of 2009. So it was a terrible moment. The economy was collapsing. Um, all the external sector went down at that time. So the financial crisis in the US, I'm talking about the first, first semester of 2009. At the same time, we face a problem regarding the government revenues. Why? Because all production went down as well. Uh, there is an oil field in Mexico named Cantarel, and this big field in the Gulf of Mexico produced more than 60% of the total Mexican production of oil during two decades. And suddenly the field went down like any other oil field. 
so we lost between 2008 and 9 like 200,000 barrels of oil a day. So you can estimate the impact in the Mexican revenues because the Mexican revenues in public sector are depending on more than 34% on oil. And the prices with the crisis went down as well, so the impact was uh, terrible for public finances. At the same time, we have the outbreak of the H1N1 in Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. Uh, of course, you know very well that uh, there, was, uh, there was a peak in criminal violence in Mexico. And in point of that, that year we had a uh, severe drought, the second worst drought ever in Mexico. So everything was complicated. <laughs> everything was difficult. So let me just address the first point regarding the economy and what happened with the Mexican economy then. So we needed to act and to act very quickly. Fortunately, we made before that in the second, in the first two years of my tenure, we made quite important reforms. One is a, a pension for public servants. Mexico changed its pension system. So just passing from the traditional system of pay as you go towards a new system of individual retirement accounts or saving accounts, we saved for public finances more than 30 points of GDP at net present value, 30 points of GDP. So actually Mexico is one of the few countries in the OECD that changed already it's their pension system. So it was a good one. So uh, we made a reform in energy, a very modest one, allowing Pemex to have flexible contracts with private sector. It was the first time ever to do so. It was not exactly the reform we needed. The, the reform I proposed was rejected for Congress. Unfortunately, the, the reform was passed two years ago, one year ago, which is good, but probably it's gonna be late. Uh, but we made a, a, a modest but important reform in this part. We made a tax reform as well in order to increase the non-oil revenues of the government before the crisis. So that, those reforms play in the right side. So we reacted and we established a strategy in the short term, which is one, uh, basically counter-cyclical measures. You know that very well. First, we increase the public spending, three points of GDP. So we, we went all the way uh, increasing public expenditures and trying to rebound the economy in the short term. But it is, this is very important, you know, because the biggest temptation for any government is to expend a lot and to increase expense. That's the easy part of that, but the problem is how to reduce the deficit. But at that time, we realized that we need to increase public expenditures in order to protect the poorest side of the society. And actually, some of the problems we had at that time, we expanded them. For instance, the, the conditional cash transfer program called, at that time, Oportunidades. We're covering five million families in Mexico, and we increased the program in the middle of the crisis to 6.5 million families in order to protect them, and increase the payment or the transfer to the, each one of, them, one of those families. We established a quite important program to preserve jobs, some of them on a temporary basis. For instance, we opened new archaeological sites, uh, hiring people by three or two, six months uh, in several places, so we were able to employ almost 1.2 million people in over a basis of three to six months that year. Or in the export-oriented sector, there was the risk that the companies were going to fire almost half a million workers in that sector, in automotive industry, appliances, electronics, and so on. So the program is, or the program was that we talk with the unions, we talk with the companies, and we reached agreements one by one, and the agreement was basically this. If you, instead of fire the worker, you pay one third of his salary, and the worker 
accepts instead to be fired, to be paid one third less of his salary during six months, the federal government was going to pay, and actually we paid the other third part. So in that way, we saved almost half a million jobs in the export-oriented sector. We had not money to do so much more months, actually it was exactly the time, but finally, at the end, we were observing that the curve of economic growth started to, to go up again, and the company saw exactly the same, and, uh, but we saved those jobs at that time. Now, the problem with contracyclical measures is this is, is one shot only, it's one shot weapon, so you need to reduce the deficit immediately, otherwise you will lose the control of the economy. And actually that happened with several economies. I remember several meetings, meetings of, for instance, in the G20. We had an inc quite interesting discussions with other presidents and prime minister. And I remember a couple of conversations with Rodriguez Zapatero, the president of Spain. Uh, he told me, well, Felipe, we have no chance to reduce the deficit because we are still in crisis. And we observe, uh, say, well, President, we are exactly in the same position, but we need to do so. Otherwise, Mexico could lose the confidence and the trust of the global markets, and we can suffer a terrible crisis as in the past we suffered. Finally, we reduce the deficit in the second part of 2009. Spain expanded its deficit, and the markets punish dramatically Spain and Greece and Italy and other countries with very big deficits through interest rates. So we, that's the funny part of contracyclical measure. The, the problem is how to reduce the deficit. And in order to do that, we design an exit strategy. It's a very elegant name for a very old recipe, which is reduce your expenditures and increase your revenues. So basically, we increase the revenues, and I paid a very high political cost in order, in order to do so. I propose to increase taxes. Uh, Pemex had the control of the price of gasoline, for instance. We, by tradition, Mexico was increasing gradually the price of gasoline. I stopped the, incre the, the increasing process during the crisis, and. Uh, reincorporated those, the, that again in order to increase again the gasoline. I paid a very high political cost for that. But finally, the government got a lot of new revenues. And at the same time, we reduced the public expenditure. And not only reduced it, but all, also we provided to the markets very aggressive signals in order to demonstrate that we were going to go completely serious about that. For instance, I proposed to the Congress to reduce and actually disappear three secretaries, three ministries in Mexico. You know, agrarian reform, tourism, and something like public servant secretary. So the Congress and press became very aggressive against me. Oh, this guy, the president doesn't care about tourism. How is that possible? No. No, I want to reduce just the secretary, and I want to incorporate the, the task in, under the umbrella of other ministries or whatever. Finally, the Congress rejected my proposal, which it was expected between us. You know? But the markets say, well, this guy is trying to do the right things in order to reduce the deficit. And we did other measures. For instance, one of the most difficult ones was to close a very old and very complicated uh, electric utility in Mexico City. How complicated was it? Well, Lucy Fuerza, it's a company with, uh, it was a company that it was duplicating the service because there is another state-owned electric utility in Mexico, CFE, but in a very inefficient way. Just to give you some idea about this, uh, 44,000 employees, 23,000 retirees, and actually these guys were earning almost three times the salaries of these guys. So once you retire, you get at least 1.5 your own salary. And the people in the company 
uh, they were retiring at 44, 45 years old. <laughs> Honestly. You know? And a lot of things like uh, you can imagine the entitlements and liabilities were growing and growing and growing and growing. Upon the price of the people who was paying or were paying for electricity upon the tariffs, the government needed to subsidize the company with almost $4 billion a year over the price of the electricity. And incredible rigidities. For instance, uh, if you work for this company, suppose in the same area, and the workers need to move from Cambridge to Boston or the other way around, the government or the, own, the owner of the company needed to pay uh, for hotel, laundry services, and restaurants or whatever. With the technology, if you have the capability to fix a lamp in the street with one single person or two and a van or whatever, and stairs. According with the contract, you need to hire 10 persons. And if that van has, for instance, had some kind of flat tire, or whatever, they cannot, they could not fix the tire. They need to call another group to fix the tire. The union, a very Marxist, very ideological, very radical, was opposed to the use of computers. Why? Because computers are threatening the jobs, isn't it? No? So there were not computers in the offices of the utility. You have a problem with, the, with your receipt or you, with your bill, you need to go to the office to make a line of maybe two hours. When you get a counter, somebody tells you, well, let me check you. She or he goes to the back, take your card in a paper, written by pencil, so your consumption is this. No, it's not, oh, maybe, let me write that. Let me fix that. And with a small tip, you can fix that. No? <laughs> so it was a crazy issue. Of course, the productivity of the company, I'm not talking about the, the market, uh, but only this company. You can see the sales per worker compared with the other utility in Mexico. So completely inefficient, problematic, and very expensive more than $4 billion. So we decided, or we were started to think about how to close the company. And, it is, and when I say we, I'm talking about at least five or six presidents, including me, because the law established when this company was founded in the 60s that this company should be closed. But no one wanted to do so. Why? Because it was too problematic. Imagine what could happen if you have against you the union, 44,000 or 60,000 60, people against you, controlling the electricity in Mexico City and the center of the country, which implies the control of 25 million people, not only for electricity, but also for drinking water and so on. And the permanent threat of the union was, if you do something with me, I will shut down the electricity service, the electric service, and I will paralyze Mexico City and its metropolitan area and the center of the republic. And that was completely true, by the way. So we need to evaluate that. So the worst case scenario was no power for 25 million people, <laughs> non drinking water in Mexico City, and all those people mobilized in the street. So I received an advice of my team saying, Mr. President, it is impossible. Your predecessors did the right thing, meaning nothing. <laughs> so well, I got it. The next time, in two weeks, I need that you will tell me how to do it. I understand the reason for the no, but I want the reason for the yes. And they came to my office and said, well, Mr. President, we consider that we need to fit several conditions. And if we can fix that, if we can get them, and only if we can get them, maybe you can decide it. Conditions like how to ensure the service itself, how to get the explicit support of other unions, in particular from the other utility, 
how to get the support of the Mexico City Authority, which actually belonged to another party. And officially, he never said hello to me because he didn't recognize me as president, but, <laughs> but we talk all the time and uh, uh, out of the screens, no? How to get the support for governors of relevant states? How to pay the workers immediately and very well paid? How to get the political support from the opposition, at least for the biggest one at that time? How to get to be able to take over the most important facilities? Um, how to have the capacity to, to have a, like a crowd control, a massive or the control? How to, can, could you control? with minimizing violence, for instance, 6,000 people in the streets in Mexico City, and so on. And how to get the public opinion support. So we work like by three months preparing all those conditions. And there was one day in which like a checklist say, well, yes, 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 yes. And say, we go. So we pick a specific day, it was a Saturday, <laughs> which day could be, well, I remember that, we explored the conditions, and what's exactly the day in which Mexico's team of soccer, we say football, the real football, sorry for that. <laughs> Mexico soccer, no, sorry for that, no. no. I mean, it's with a foot, no, with a fit, no. So Mexico's team was playing in order to gain its pass to the world championship in South Africa. So we were playing against El Salvador, it was a crucial game, and once Mexico made the second goal, they say, well, we're done. Go ahead, tonight. <laughs> so we advance, and well, one day I will talk about that. So basically, <laughs> what is the situation? Currently, there are only 3,000 workers providing the service instead of 44,000. We reduce almost 70% the oper operating cost. We reduce inefficiencies, for instance, the, the power cut or uh, reduce from one hour to six minutes on average for any customer. Uh, we receive 600,000 additional contracts in one year and a half. Why? Because there were a lot of uh, informal or irregular contracts, a lot of bribes, a lot of corruptions. A lot of companies, for instance, were unable to be connected to the grid, so now we could connect them, and so on. Well, one day I will talk about this beautiful case, no? It's a case for business school, by the way, but no, it's, I think it's for government school, you know? Because uh, Harvard made a study case of CFE, uh, Lucy Fuerza, but it's, honestly, it's not a business case. No? It's more related with uh, all these conditions, which is not exactly business, anyway. Okay, well, but the point is, coming back, we reduce costs, we increase revenues, but we decided if we are going to pay a very high political cost to face the crisis, do the right way. So we go all the way to increasing competitiveness of the economy. And in order to do that, we put in place several strategies. One is we bet in trade. I believe in freedom, I believe in free trade, I believe in the market, it's, it's a necessary, it's, the market is not enough. It is not a sufficient condition to provide justice. So we need the action of the government in order to, to fix the inequality and the lack of opportunities of the people. But market is a necessary condition for production and competitiveness. So we bet on trade. I remember these meetings, I say, in the G20 there, there is always in the final communique an expression saying we support free trade, we are against protectionism and so on, but the day we declared that in the G20, probably 15 out of 20 presidents, the day, later, the day after, they raised tariffs and they established more protection measures against trade. So we did the other way around. We continue the policy of free trade agreements. Look this nice, how do you say it? Mapa Mundi, whatever. You can observe Mexico is exactly in the center of the world. Oh? <laughs> so we, we have an incredible advantage of, uh, 
Well, you can, you can move a little bit, but anyway. No? So we have an incredible advantage in terms of a geostrategic advantage. So we continue our policy of free trade. And actually, even in the middle of the crisis, we reduce tariffs for industry with a huge opposition from private sector, by the way. A lot of companies protected say, well, the president wants to kill us, which is not exactly true, but anyway. So we, we reduce tariffs in the middle of the crisis from more than 10% to 4% on average. Why? Because in this global economy, the largest product, which is trade, it is not the final product, but the inputs and raw materials or middle products or intermediate goods. So that is probably 80% of the, of the trade. A lot of countries establishing protection measures made in an incredible mistake. Look at the case of Brazil right now. They increase the economy protecting the industry. But if you want to produce a car in Mexico, you need to allow any company to import towards Mexico any kind of input, anyone. The brakes, the electric system, the electronic. You want to produce mobile phones, you need to allow the companies to get the screens and the, all those electronic devices from anywhere. So we did so. We opened the economy. We reduced tariffs, most of the cases, to zero. And that was an incredible component of the new competitiveness of the manufacturing industry in Mexico. Other. We invest a lot in infrastructure. You can see this map. It's roads and highways in Mexico. Uh, in 2006, if you consider the either new highways or new roads or the renovation process or modernization process, so for instance, there is a road of uh, six or seven meters wide. We renovated all the carpet. We fixed the curbs. We opened the road to 12 meters, for instance. And that only considering building or rebuilding roads or highways, this is the, the infrastructure process uh, we did in between 2006 and 2012. So we are talking about 20, 22,000, I think it's in the next slide. Uh, yeah, like 14,000 miles in six years, which is more than the previous two administrations combined. Uh, and with an incredible impact in the regional development. Look at this bridge, it's my favorite. It's Baluarte Bridge. Uh, between this column and that column, there are like half a kilometer, like 500 meters. Four lines here. And between this point of the bridge to the river, actually over here, no? <laughs> there are more than 400 meters. And everything is pending from steel cables, which is actually we got the Guinness record of the highest bridge in this style, in its type in the world. No? So, but, but it's Mexican company and Mexican uh, workers and so on. Well, other, we deregulated the economy. For instance, I, we organized like a public contest. So we published a, a question among the public and the question was, what is exactly the most absurd and the useless procedure at federal level? No? What is the most stupid regulation we have? No? A, a lot of people participated. No? <laughs> a lot of proposal. And finally, with that, another measure is we reduce, like, uh, just erase like 16,000 regulations in Mexico. Uh, so the time, for instance, to start a business in Mexico only at federal level came down from 60 days to almost 10 days. For instance, the computers, the software between, well, if you want to open a small business at federal level at that time, you need to go first to foreign relations office. Why? Well, actually, nobody knows, but you need to go there. <laughs> you need to ask for a permit there. You need to be registered as taxpayers, and you need to be registered in the Social Security Institute. Actually, the government 
or are collecting a lot of money from that. But curiously, the software between the tax office and the social security institutions were unable to connect each other. I don't know what is the expression. It's just the two kind of software that are enemies each other. So it was absurd. No? So we organized a big software in which in only two hours in the office of the say, notario, you can open a business in less than two hours instead, instead of those 60 days because all the registers are connected already. Uh, we support the SMEs, basically with a new mechanism in which we stop the old practice providing subsidies directly to the SMEs and we put all the money besides the banking system. And we started to provide uh, like a support enhancing guarantees to the SMEs and, and saying to the bank, well, you will uh, provide a loan for this lady with a, a, a pharmacy or whatever and I will guarantee losses by 20%, 30% or whatever. And with that, even in the middle of the crisis, we increased the loans in terms of money more than 600%. And that's a very important part, component of the recovery. Uh, we never stopped investing in social aspects, in particular health services. For instance, uh, we built 1,200 new hospitals or clinics in Mexico. It could be small like this, like a, uh, 12 beds, or it could be 400 beds, but more than 1,000, 1,200. And we rebuilt other 2,400. So basically, was a complete overhaul of the infrastructure and health services. Plus, we, through the so-called Seguro Popular, of the popular insurance, we passed from 60 million people covered by health insurance to 106 million in Mexico, which implies almost full or universal coverage in Mexico in terms of health services. And similar things in education. We built 1,100 new high schools, 140 new college or universities, all of them public and tuition-free universities. And most of them oriented towards technology, like MIT, by the way. Not exactly MIT. No, it is <laughs> it was very, very simple. But, uh, but the idea was, honestly, was like this. Well, we need to provide be better trained people to the industry. Because we discovered a quite important bottleneck is the lack of trained people. It's not exactly a question of salaries or whatever. It's, it's a question of what, what kind of people you would, tr you would hire. One example. There was an airport in Querétaro. Uh, it was very expensive. It was very criticized because regardless of the name, which actually it is like an intercontinental airport, whatever, nobody had any interest to go there, no, at that time. <clears throat> it went well. We need to do something with this airport. So we talked with the companies in order to establish some plants over there in order to manufacturing or whatever. And they say, no, because we need engineers, so we need at least uh, technical people to operate as well. So we built there an aerospace university in order to provide, honestly, the idea was better trained workers. So Bombardier and other companies started to come to Querétaro. And currently, some of those engineers are not screwing planes, are designing the new engines of the Airbus 380, which is the largest plane in the world. So uh, that was the idea about the, it provided a lot of uh, competitiveness. Actually in Mexico, uh, in 2012, there were more than 100,000 new engineers every single year, which is more than in Germany or the United Kingdom or Spain or Brazil, blah, 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 blah you know? Which is quite important, not all of them have the same quality, honestly, yes. But it's quite important for the companies to invest in Mexico. So some of the results, finally, in terms of uh, the deficit, when I left office, the deficit in Mexico was less than one point of GDP, trending to zero 
actually the goal of the next year was going to be zero deficit. Uh, you can compare with other countries here. Uh, it had the lowest ratio regarding public debt, was public debt over GDP, 32%. The average of OECD is almost 70%. At that time, the US was 87. So very, very sound public finances. Actually, we issued a bond in 2010, which is the, the period or the, what was the name of the, the length of the bond was 100 years at the rate of 6%, 100 years. Uh, all the problem regarding the pre previous crisis, economic crisis in Mexico was regarding the, the government of central bank ran out of uh, foreign currency, dollars. But you see now that the amount of reserves when I left office is over here, uh, like here, no? Where more or was, it was 2.5 times the total external debt of the government. So again, the soundness of the public finances was really good for Mexico. And in terms of competitiveness, Mexico passed, for instance, in doing business of the World Bank from the place number 73 to the place 53. In terms of the global services location, we passed from the place number 17 to number six. Or other more pragmatical examples, for instance, uh, Guillermo was telling about the manufactured goods. Mexico is exporting more than 60% of the total manufactured goods in Latin America and Caribbean region, including Brazil, by the way. Uh, and it's quite comp competitive on that. When I took office, Mexico was uh, the ninth largest exporter of vehicles in the world. In these years, we surpassed the United Kingdom, the United States, Spain, and other countries. And so now, Mexico is the fourth largest exporter of vehicles in the world and growing. Um, finally, well, I talk about the aerospace industry. Mexico, in those years, was the country that received the largest amount of new investment in aerospace industry in the world. Uh, the jobs we lost during the crisis, we recovered in the, second, in the two years later. More than that, we multiplied by four. And the economy, you can see clearly the, how deep was the economic crisis here. But we recovered the economy, and between the end of the crisis, 2009, 2012, we had an expansion of 16% of the economy, growing at rates on average at like 4.4% and so on. Actually, at the end of the government, was started to coin the expression of, this is the front page of the economist. I don't like these sombreros, honestly. It's like a, <laughs> huh? like a two, it's, it's only for, for spring breaker. But, um, uh, but okay. It, uh, the point is the economies on the front page and so on. So the rise of Mexico in November of 2012. And a lot of expression regarding uh, the performance of the Mexican economy at that time, 2012, 2018. Well, that is the point. My point is uh, you will face a lot of troubles, problems, challenges when you are governing. But the point is that you should not ask, or maybe you, you should ask to to have not those kind of problems in government. But it is more important than that to ask or pray to have the people around you with the talent and the courage and the commitment in order to overcome the problem and actually transform the problem in a great opportunity. And I think that was the case of Mexico. So those are my points. If you have questions, it would be a pleasure to, to answer. Thank you. Question? Hi, President. Thanks a lot for your great presentation. It was uh, um, an honor to, to be here and, and hear all your um, accomplishments while in office. I have my question about the energy reform. Your party was crucial in allowing this reform to, to take place, and that was a great thing. 
Uh, but I was wondering what your thoughts about the implementation process. You also uh, praised the, the virtues of free trade, and part of the reform uh, contains clauses for local content development. So I was wondering what, what are your opinions towards local content development in the oil industry, and what do you think about the implementation process of the current energy reform? Well, uh, the, the local content is a quite a specific issue and a very controversial one. I understand the point in which you need to involve the local industry in the new investment. However, according with the numbers we need, honestly, that part could deter the amount of the investment. And I think that uh, what a country like Mexico needs is massive investment coming from abroad. So that the point is we have not enough capital. We have not uh, enough uh, technology. So I don't see a real problem if, uh, the, actually we should look for foreign companies or capital, technology and everything coming towards Mexico. But it's, it's good. It's, uh, that would be great. The, the problem I'm, I'm seeing with the implementation is this the old problem that Mexico has that as long the implementation could be upon the basis of transparency and fairness and no corruption, it will be fine. Otherwise, like a lot of things in Mexico could be very complicated. Second, the reform, unfortunately, it's, it's quite good. It's very good. I think it's a, it's a great event for Mexico. I'm afraid, a little bit afraid that it's coming late. If I was the first president that I proposed an energy reform, allowing private sector in the gas and oil sector, and I was accused like a, you know, capital senior or whatever, no? If the reform could be approved in 2008 when I proposed it, today we could have a lot of invest, investment already done and Mexico producing probably almost double of the barrels of oil that we are producing. However, with this new uh, landscape, with these prices in oil, I think the investment will be a little bit more complicated to get. So I hope it's not too, I hope I'm wrong and it's not too late to do that. But the other point is about the reform itself. No? When I propose it, the opposition block it. No? When the opposition came uh, uh, to government, then they accepted. And my party, and I think it's the responsible behavior, my party supported instead of blocking the reform. And that was a crucial issue. So the big thing, the big change in Mexico in 2013 was not only the change of government, it was the change of the opposition. <laughs> it was more relevant. And the, the lesson to me, the tale is that, well, it is not the same to be a spring breaker than bartender. So you, came the role, you change the role, it's a completely different perspective. No? You, to be in the opposition is like to be you know, in heaven, no? To be in the government is like to be in the earth, no? It's a completely different perspective on that. Thank you very much for the uh, interesting insights. Do you think marijuana should be legalized in the United States? Sorry? Do you think marijuana should be legalized in the United States? It could be. Actually, it's from, going. From Mexico's perspective, that is. I'm, I cannot talk about Mexico's perspective. What I'm sure is the consumption of marijuana here is killing thousands of people in Mexico. Um, the Americans, honestly, don't care about that. If the Americans don't reduce their consumption on drugs, marijuana actually is the cheaper and is not exactly the problem anymore. I mean, it's, there are other drugs uh, which economic value is much higher. But uh, I say in the United Nations, if the American government, Congress, and society 
don't reduce their consumption. At least they need to reduce the incredible amount of money flying towards criminals' hands in Mexico and everywhere. I don't care about your consumption. I don't care about your life. I mean, I care, but it's your problem. <laughs> what I care is stop the flow of weapons and money towards Mexico. And it's your own responsibility, moral and political responsibility, as America, as the United States, to find the way in which you can stop that flow. If you can stop the flow of money, either enforcing the law or regulating the markets or liberalizing the markets, it's good. It's good for me. As long as you can stop that money flowing through Mexico. And the other point is the weapons. Uh, that's my point. I think that there are upsides and downsides in the legalization of any drugs. Clearly, I understand that the upside in the economic side is uh, you can reduce the price coming from the black market, and then you can reduce the incentives regarding the for crime. The downside in the economic in the economics as well is nobody knows exactly the performance of the demand. We are assuming that the demand for drugs is unelastic. That's a general assumption. However, nobody knows that market. If the demand for drugs is unelastic, yes, you can reduce the price and the economic incentives. If the demand for drugs is elastic instead, with the liberalization, you will increase actually the profits for the, for the, for the criminals uh, in, in order to have a monopolistic behavior. Anyway. And the other is the social impacts. You know, honestly, nobody, I had not seen any serious research about what could be the social impact getting access to drugs for kids. Because what I saw is a kid with 11 or 12 years old getting into drugs, it's quite difficult to rescue him, if I can say that. So because it's an addiction that I cannot manage. And uh, it is a fact that the, the regulation or the prohibition is, is getting away uh, from those kids. Is there maybe other solution? What could be the impact in social terms? That situation needs to be explored seriously. And it's not enough to say yes or not. I can say I have three beautiful children. I'm talking to them all the time about drugs, all the time about addictions. All, time, all the time about their friends, asking about what parties are they attending. And I can say, I would take care of my kids, and you take care of your kids. I can say that like a citizen. I could not say as president. Why? Because a very poor lady in Chalco, who is, I don't know, she's working as a uh, waiter or worker or whatever, she has a daughter, 12 years old, going all, all the afternoons to the school, and a lot of guys trying to provide her drugs or whatever. That lady, that woman, believes that the president is responsible for her daughter, and she's right. So as president, I cannot say, well, I don't care about everybody of you. No? Take responsibility of your own kids. As citizens, I can say that. And finally, the political side. When you have 86% of the people against that, it is an issue in the political field. So in conclusion, I think it's, an, it's a serious issue and needs to be explored, researched, and debated. But in the case of the United States, if that is the way in which the American will stop the flow of money towards Mexico, welcome. President Calderon, again, thank you very much for, for being here and, and giving us your insights. You talked in your presentation about how you were able to fend off or at least successfully deal with uh, the unions and this utility company, Lucy Fuerza, and because it was a change that was needed. You told us also that you took some decisions, for example, that affected the, the private sector in manufacturing, like lowering tariffs in certain products. How do you deal, how do you manage with opposition from the private sector? I come from Nuevo León, and I know that uh, the private sector, especially the industry, can be very stubborn as well. They are tough guys, but anyway. 
Uh, it's, cu it's curious because sometimes it, it was similar to this expression of not in my backyard, no? Sometimes I, what I have listened is, listened is like, a, yes, I believe in free market as long as the free market is upon <laughs> my neighbor businesses or whatever, no? It's a, what is Mexican expression? I say, la voluntad de Dios en la milpa de mi compadre, no? <laughs> I cannot translate that. You can help me with that. <laughs> uh, no, but, but the point is they understand. And one of the most challenges issue as president or being in government is you need to face a lot of interest. And I'm not saying illegal or not decent interest, just particular interest. And uh, that's your duty. You need to align those interests or you need to enforce uh, the, uh, the law or you need to establish the priorities of the nation. And clearly the priority is the national interest is over and upon any other interest in the country. And in the national interest, you need to open the markets. You can improve the economy. You need to take care about the, the, there will be always in this process winners and losers. You need to take care of the losers. For instance, the workers of one industry, you need to retrain them. You need to provide them opportunities. We did so with the workers of the Lucy Fuerza, for instance. We pay them like three times the money we should pay according to the law. So basically, we pay to those workers 2.5 years on average in salaries as a compensation for, for the extension of the company. 2.5 years of salaries. And beyond that, we provided them with opportunities to get a, a franchise. Uh, we trained some of them to get, uh, to run their own businesses. We hired them with other companies, for instance, providing services to the government and so on. You need to take care with the losers in any process, but at a comprehensive level, a general level, it's clearly much better. You can improve the situation from, for everyone. No? The other point regarding the marijuana is, I forgot to say, beyond the debate about legalization, the real problem of Mexico, it is not the drugs itself. It is not the so-called war on drugs, which is by the, actually is a Nixon expression. It's not mine, it's not Mexican one. The problem is organized crime, which is slightly different from drugs itself, from narco traffic. So what is narco traffic? Literally, is this traffic of narcotics to the US. That's the traditional problem and the traditional view. The problem in this century is not narco traffic anymore. The problem is organized crime, which is completely different. Uh, organized crime is That kind of delinquency that is trying to extract the rents, illegal or legal rents of the society. That's different from drugs. And th there is a quite important paper uh, made at Kennedy School. Oh my God, I cannot remember right now the author, but it's a quite important Bostonian. And he explored the organized crime in the 60s in Boston. And he organized crime, at the end, the real business of organized crime, it is not illegally. The real business is extortion. They are extracting the rents and they explore the illegal side of Boston, prostitution at that time, gambling, uh, drugs, etc. And the point was to extract the rents because a sexual worker in a corner, she's unable to, to call for the protection of the police. Why? Because she's in the legal side. You know? so, she has no other option than pay the protection racket or the extortion. However, in Mexico it's the same, but now when the criminals take over the control of the police corps at municipal level or at state government level, no one is able to call for the protection of the law. And the criminals start to extract the rents of the people through extortion, kidnapping or protection rackets. So the real problem for Mexico is exactly that. It's completely different from the traditional problem of narco But this is an issue of a very long conference, maybe other day. No? 
Yeah, uh, President, thank you for, for your time. It's, it's great to hear like these uh, successful stories from Mexico, but it happens not to be the case in, in many other places in, in Latin America. So I would love to have your like brief view on, on, on why it has taken us so long to ramp up as a region in general, and, and what's your future view on, 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 the, on the region? And, and if you could talk about how, uh, I mean, how, what should be the, the leadership roles from, from countries or experiences like Mexico? I, well, the sh probably the problem with Latin America is we bet a lot in commodity prices last decade. So we are incredible big producers of oil, soja, as everybody say, with soja, or, or cattle in Argentina, Cooper uh, in Chile, uh, a lot of food everywhere, Brazil, of course. And the last, what was the phenomenon last decade? The big phenomenon in the economic world was the entrance of China to the global market, was the entrance of China to WTO, 2000. After that, the Chinese demand was so huge, so it increased dramatically the prices of commodities from minerals, gold, to food, to anything, oil, by the way. With such increase, we producers of commodities and raw materials, we got an incredible decade. It was called the decade of Latin America, isn't it? But the economies were unable to change toward more aggregated value in our output. Actually, most of the economies, and the biggest one in concrete, Brazil, they closed the economy, protecting their own industry. But through this mechanism of protection, they became very inefficient. And with that, once the commodity prices went down dramatically, which is the case, all the economies, economies are going down as well. So Brazil has two years in a row in recession, or almost recession. And a lot of economies producing commodities are going down dramatically. If you don't change the economy in order to mix and balance the production, you will have that problem. We, unfortunately, we didn't get the opportunity to change and aggregate value to our productions in the region. And talking about leadership, I think we are failing dramatically, uh, allowing uh, things that are happening today, for instance, in Venezuela or Cuba or other countries. Three days ago, the mayor of Caracas was uh, put in jail but by a very authoritarian regime. And nobody say anything in the region. Why? Because we are losing the self-consciousness of our problems. Nobody say, I, I, at least I didn't hear anything. I went to Caracas 15 days ago to spread my solidarity with those people. Maduro, <laughs> by the way, Maduro, told that I was paid by narco-traffic. <laughs> and I said, well, it is an honor to, to hear such kind of things coming from this guy, no? <laughs> oh, I was afraid that he was to say some positive things about me. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but saying that I was paid by narco-traffic in Caracas is like a joke that uh, it's funny by itself. I don't know what is the, it's un chiste que se cuenta solo, no? So, Anyway, but we need to, to be more responsible about the region, about talking about leadership. Well, maybe final question, no? Because we need to close it well. Oh? Uh, President Calderon, th thanks a lot again uh, for coming to talk to us. I'm originally from Russia, but I lived in Mexico for a number of years and actually worked in the federal government. Uh, my question, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, that was my punchline. Um, so you need to explain me that. <laughs> my question is on violence in Mexico. You touched a little bit upon that. It's this very complex issue, long-lasting. And your government and you yourself, your approach to this issue was more like the hard approach and the approach of the current government and more a soft approach. And neither seems to be like succeeding, uh, which is perhaps impossible in the short, short term. So my question is, having learned those lessons from your time, as the president of Mexico, and seeing what's going on right now, what do you think could, could resolve this issue? Thank you. Well, you need to do both. Actually, the strategy should be comprehensive. 
I mean, uh, as you say, the hard approach is you need to enforce the law. You need to face the criminals. This one exists. Second is you need to rebuild the law enforcement institutions. And third, you need to work rebuilding the social fabric of the society. Uh, the first is relevant because the traditional view in Mexico was don't face the criminals. Let allow them to do whatever they want. I don't agree with that, but supposedly it was the right strategy. I don't, be, I don't believe so, but it was the right strategy in the last century. If the criminals were only busy trying to pass drugs to the United States, a lot of authorities just took the bribe, took the money, get corrupted with no consequences, supposedly. When Mexico became a middle class society with a lot of economic stability, with economic growth, we started to get uh, purchasing capacity. So we started to consume drugs as well. And the criminals expanded their businesses. And with that expansion came the problem. Why? Because they, in order to control their businesses, what is the, you are in business sector, no? MBA. What is the crucial aspect of exporting business, which is narco-traffic? The crucial aspect are logistical issues and transport. However, what is the crucial aspect of a business like Starbucks, retailing? You need to have the control of multiple points of sales. You need to know how many cups of coffee you are able to sell every day, at which te what temperature, uh, what size of the cups, no? what is the preference of the people. You need to collect the money daily. So these guys needed the control of the territory. Following the old recipe, let alone to do whatever they want, they took over easily a lot of cities. So when I took office, what I realized is criminals were in control of wide regions of the country. They were the real authority. What is the definition of authority? The authority has the monopoly of the law. They were the law. The authority has the monopoly of public forces. They, they got, they had the public forces. If the authority has the monopoly of taxes, they put the taxes. The extortion, the protection racket. So following the old recipe, they don't get, don't involve in problems, don't phase them, which is the traditional one. That was not a solution. That's exactly the problem. We need to phase them with full force of the state. Second, we need to rebuild the institutions. One tail, for instance. I established my first time ever in Mexico a vetting process on federal forces. Even in the army, the navy, um, I created a federal police. And the vetting process is an exam, toxicological exam, socio-ecological exam, socio-economic socio exam, psychological and um, polygraph exams. Either to get into the police corps or to remain in the police corps. And I pass a law in Congress in order to obligate the governors to do the same at local level. And they started to react. And in a big table, a very unequilibrated one, the so-called the Security Council, Federal Security Council, 32 governors and myself, and we need to get consensus. Mm. <laughs> one governor say, oh, Mr. President, everybody knows your intention. You are very well intentioned. But you want, we will have police like in Switzerland. And that is not possible because Mexico is different. You know, or reality, or a culture, and you, come on. I say, Governor, no, I, I don't accept that, but even though I want that your citizens could have a police with as higher standard as the best police in the world, what exactly is your problem with that? Finally, they won, they, they take off the exams to the police, and that governor is exactly the governor of Guerrero, and in, in his state, the police kidnap 43 students and kill them. The police. So you need to rebuild the institution. I don't, be, I don't believe that. Just, and, and third, and most important, yes, you need to win the battle against the criminals, providing opportunities for the kids. That's the reason of the schools. We started with that. 1,100 new high schools. It's because we realized that we can provide for the kids opportunity to study and follow up. We can, you have an opportunity to avoid and they get into crime. Uh, but you need to work on that.
But this soft approach that just providing education and opportunity, you can fix the problem, that is not true. You need to do so, but you need to do both. You need to enforce the law, you need to face the criminals, and you need to provide social opportunities, and at the same time, you need to rebuild the law enforcement institution. Haiti is doing the same. Three years ago, Haiti was cows, only cows. Now the United Nations is spending a lot of money in a very useless way. But the one thing that they are doing very well is rebuilding the institutions. And Haiti is improving. In Mexico, there are quite successful cases. Nuevo León, for instance. The business sector pushed a lot over the governor, and governors say, well, I will be another police, as the president is recommending, and I will establish full betting process for all of them. And now the crime went down like 74% from its peak. And Juarez was exactly the same, and Tijuana, the same. There were a lot of success. And there are other states in which the governor didn't do their job, which is the case of Tamaulipas or Michoacán, my own state. And when I say the governor is not allowing me to clean up the state, they say, oh, this crazy guy. And now, last year, appeared several videos in which the governor was talking with the criminals and arranging the life of everyone else. So I think it, both approaches are needed, independently of the debate of legalization. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.